A round of applause for Richard Cobbett. Thank you so much, it means at least I get one. Um, quick, quick introduction, uh, I'm Richard, uh, I've been a kind of game journalist for about 16 years, currently lead writer on Didalic Studio West for Long Journey Home, uh, also been a writer on Sun the Sea for London and a few other games like that. And basically the subject I'm coming to talk to you today is comedy, or rather humour, largely driven by something of an unfortunate problem which I've kind of seen for many years, which is that many people who write adventures don't actually play all that many of them. And as a result, I think a lot of the time we see solutions to problems, but then they don't get picked up. We kind of sort of see the same mistakes being made over and over again. So what I wanted to do is basically pull kind of some of the analytical side of my journalism things uh, out for you um, for a look at, basically, if this thing works, the comedy of Monkey Island. An example, basically, not of anything too exciting, but of how to kind of start breaking things down, how to maybe kind of sort of find some of the little details in games you might just sort of skip over, and hopefully how to make that work better for you. And I've chosen comedy because comedy is hard. And writing a genuinely funny game is even harder still. I mean, I'd argue that in, let's say, 36 years of gaming, we've still seen very few genuinely great examples. Uh, I mean, here are a few of mine, you know, Psychonauts, you know, there's Portal 2, Callahan's is a bit of an obscure one. Um, I'm sure you guys have your own examples. Anyone want to suggest something really funny? Stick up through. Brilliant example. Anyone else? Nelly Kudala. Uh, not, so, not, not so sure about that one. <laughs> anyway, that, great, great examples. Obviously, I'm not saying there aren't funny games. There are many, many funny games. But they kind of tend to be the exception. And what passes for comedy in many games just tends to be, honestly, fairly depressing. Um, if we kind of go up to Monkey Island 2, this is the kind of game which sort of set the trend back in the early 90s. And a lot of people are really only doing the same basic surface level thing. Endless one-liners just loaded into a Gatling gun in the hope that the snarks per second will land enough hits. Uh, genre parodies that set out to mock something, but basically just do the same thing, kind of go, isn't that crap? Lots of cartoon wackiness, which can be awesome, but just as often lacks any real substance. And, like I said, worst of all, games making the same old mistakes again and again, despite being surrounded by some great examples of the form. And that's why I wanted to focus this talk on just one example, one single joke from a game that I think that most of this room will know and call genuinely funny. You probably guess what it is, but of course, it's Monkey Island 2. I wouldn't say it's the funniest game yeah, ever by any stretch. I'd say that the likes of, say, Portal 2 and Psychonauts have largely surpassed it. I do think, though, it's a great example of a game that understands comedy theory. In particular, the words of the script are only part of the job, and that without the rest of the game pulling its weight, there's really only so much they can hope to do. I'm thinking of scenes like the opening, uh, Guybrush reuniting with his parents, only to have them start singing the head bones connected to the leg bone. I'm thinking of things like him reuniting with his former lover Elaine while in drag, which is made even funnier by the fact that most of this conversation goes past without either of them mentioning it. <laughs> Unfortunately, what generally people took from the games and games of this era wasn't the scene level stuff, it was the type way they built their humor, but the most surface or dialogue tree gags, or as I like to call them, quick response jokes. You know, feed line, quip, feed line, quip, feed line, quip, repeat, ad infinitum for about 20 hours, and you've got an adventure game. <laughs> well, at least in the early 90s and still to some extent today. And it's not too surprising that this became the style. Snark is fun, it's easy to write, and it's easy to implement. Certainly more so than persuading a busy art team that you need a whole load of new sprites for something like that. It also doesn't help that companies still typically consider writing a layer. So, excuse me. Many companies still consider writing a layer that could be easily dropped on top of the game when actually it's a critical design role. Or that, for that matter, more writing than you might think is done by freelancers with less clout than the tea lady, who at least can threaten to spit in the boss's coffee. Now, this isn't universally true, obviously, but companies that do respect writing do tend to stand out. I'd say Bioware, for instance, or uh, Fail Better, who I've had the pleasure of working with quite a bit the last couple of years. And again, I'm sure you guys can think of great examples and good on those companies. Monkey Island 2 and its ilk, though, had an advantage here. 
The writers were also typically the designers, the implementers. Uh, as I spoke to Rihanna earlier on, uh, the advantage of something like Portal 2 is that the writer can get their jokes down to the millisecond and ensure that they're as funny as possible which obviously you can't get if you're just sitting at home writing a script, submitting it, and someone else is implementing it for you. And, of course, these games tended to be written by the project leads, giving them huge scope to not only tell jokes, but to prepare the ground, to put jokes within a wider context, and generally pull it all together into a coherent whole. Let's look at the example which I've picked. It's from the first act of the game, the Largo Embargo. I'm sure everyone here knows the plot of Monkey Island 2, but just in case... Would-be would -be pirate Guybrush Threepwood is facing actual pirate Largo the Grand, trying to escape from dark and moody Scab Island. Now, before we dig into, too detail, into details, I'm obviously not saying this is the only way that you can do a joke or the only way you can set things up. As I said, the takeaway here is more looking at how the individual layers work together to create scenes that go beyond their individual elements. For example, for an anachronistic comedy game about zombie pirates in the theme park version of the Caribbean, Monkey Island 2 is actually surprisingly realistic. I don't just mean in terms of visuals, although as you can see, that's a fairly you know, realistic island, but in the general details. Pain hurts. Actions have consequences. Villains have power. Even the main quest has a little edge to it that a lot of people forget when you remember that Guybrush's objective in the game isn't to defeat the ghost pirate of the Chuck, his immortal nemesis, it's to escape him. The idea that he might actually be able to defeat him is just an impossibility. And we see this even at the start of the game, in this opening set. Largo is not a joke. He's a powerful, dangerous, vicious thug. And it's because of that that most of the jokes involving him later on get to work so well. They're not about beating him, not exactly, but rather stripping away his authority and dragging him down to Guybrush's level as a comic character. The biggest example being this scene, in which you dump a bucket of mud on his head. <laughs> the same incidentally also applies to the Chuck himself, who spends most of the game being a genuinely fearsome uh, force of destruction, but then in the last few moments of the game, you give him a wedgie and all of that is gone. <laughs> But the contrast between the seriousness and the slapstick is what makes scenes like this funny. That it's transgressive on the part of the player. It's daring. It's naughty. The same gag in an overtly comedy world like, say, Toonstruck, it wouldn't have the same edge because to a toon, a slapstick routine only matters for as long as the reaction shot lasts. Likewise, Gabriel Knight pulling this, that would be ridiculously inappropriate for his world and his type of story. And we all know he'd never be involved in any dumb puzzles. <laughs> anyway, I'm bringing up these caveats because, amongst other things, slapstick is a surprisingly misunderstood concept. Too often, it's either too weak to be funny, usually because the animation and performance doesn't really sell the anger and humiliation of the stooge, or it's too harsh. That Goldilocks zone takes real care and effort to find, and most of it comes down to one simple concept, crime and punishment, or, if you want to get Greek on this, folly and redemption. The basic gist is that for something particularly bad to happen, sorry, for something particularly bad to happen to somebody, and for us to take satisfaction in it, well, that person has to have done something to deserve it. That crime can be literal, like Largo stealing all of Guybrush's stuff. It can be telling a lie that spirals out of control. It can be any number of things. But what matters is that the punishment has to fit the crime, at least initially. Now, the more the character repeats their mistakes or digs themselves deeper, the worse the punishment can get. And again, it seems fair. Basil Fawlty, for instance, in just about any episode of Fawlty Towers, could just take the rap for whatever go whatever's going on that week within about five minutes, and he'd be fine. It's his repeated doubling down, uh, attempt to dig his way out of it, that ultimately justify his humiliation at the end of the episode. And this applies to most comedy writing, modern and classic. It's why, for instance, Bugs Bunny needs the likes of Elmer Fudd to launch the first strike before he declares, of course you realise, this means war. Without that, he comes across as a bully rather than a noble trickster, outmatching his enemies to the point that we empathise with them instead of him. This is, of course, the reason for the creation of Yosemite Sam. It's the reason why Screwy Squirrel only lasted about five episodes, because he didn't have that kind of restriction, and therefore it wasn't satisfying to watch him cut loose. Let's contrast our Largo example with a case where it went wrong. Here's a scene from the rancid Runaway 2, in which our supposed hero, Brian Basco, 
also meets an amiable Marshall Black researcher called Ben. Now, Brian needs to get something from him, a pair of bear gloves which are part of his suit, and Ben, shockingly, wants to hold on to his property. Amazing. He's generally, though, a fairly friendly character. He gives Brian much advice. <coughs> He gives Brian much advice, he's welcome to help, he's friendly, you know, there is nothing wrong with Brian. Sorry, uh, with Ben. But how does Brian thank him for this? Well, because as part of a puzzle, you have to splash him with the pheromones of a female bear in heat and send him down to the river. At which point, Brian makes this face. <laughs> yeah. This joke doesn't just fail, and wow, does it fail. It makes Brian a deeply unpleasant character to have to play, and honestly not for the first time in that game, making it worse, this puzzle was in the demo. But <laughs> we've seen this a lot. Games like Simon Sorcerer 3D starts with a whole section where you have to be mean for no apparent reason to various people you just meet on the road. Now, there is a reason for it later on, but by that point, most people will stop playing. Funnily enough, there's a very similar quote-unquote gag to this in The Simpsons, an episode called Homer vs. Dignity, which itself is widely considered the show's nadir. So, if you take one thing from this, bear rape's not funny. <laughs> anyway, the reason for all of this is fairly obvious. Acts don't get much more sociopathic and unpleasant than that. But what makes it worse in games, rather than, say, The Simpsons' example, is that the player isn't just an observer, they're a participant. They have what I call complicity in the cruelty, simply by clicking the mouse, even if it's a non-optional sequence. Now, while having a guy raped by bears is something of an extreme example, I think we can all think of a few moments where an in-game se in sequence has made us worry a little bit about the designers. Mystery of the Druids, for instance, which features a puzzle where you have to poison a beggar to steal money to make a phone call. <laughs> <laughs> These are all meant to be relatively light interludes, but the best light interludes, and again, this is just a personal opinion, but the best light interludes don't have the player going, what the shit? Yeah, and that's just adventure examples. Even something as supposedly amoral as Grand Theft Auto has to be careful. Now, I'm not talking about running people over or anything like that. They're just arcade splatter matter. Nobody cares about the random NPC. But when you give the player a reason to see the individuals as people, that makes a difference. A good example is where I stopped playing San Andreas. It's a, uh, a mission where, for the crime of slightly annoying his sister, main character CJ has to kill everybody on a building site, lock the foreman in a port loo and then bury him alive in concrete. I don't want to do that. <laughs> at, at the very least, not without a really, really good setup for that. I mean, bury another crime lord alive, like, say, Saints Row 2, perhaps. But Monkey Island 2 does this really well, both the level that it picks and its setup. Its entire first chapter, in particular, is devoted to making Largo pay, and not only that, but deserves the worst day of his life. As such, by the time you finally get to this point, with the mud over the door, you aren't just solving a puzzle, you aren't inconveniencing an NPC. You've seen Largo throw his weight all over town, you've seen him threaten people, you've had him directly work against you to steal your money. You are beating Largo, a guy so tough he has his own theme music. And as a result, it feels <coughs> naughty, it feels dangerous. You know, the fact you can't die in most LucasArts games doesn't really matter. It's the beginning of the end for him. The next time you see him, it's even being further emasculated when the something of the thread that you're trying to get as a part of this puzzle ends up being this pearly white bra. Um, there's nothing within the entire sequence, though, for the player to feel bad about, just the enjoyment of seeing a bully get what's coming to him. The fascinating thing about complicity, though, is that as much as the players will chafe at being forced to do something unpleasant, having the option usually goes down really well. Uh, for example, uh, beating Max over the head in that <laughs> Max's rat game. Uh, trying to set everybody on fire in Psychonauts just to see their reactions. And everyone in Psychonauts has a reaction to everything. I'm going to give an example which sounds extreme, but I'm going to say right now, no player, male or female, has not tried it. In Little Big Adventure 2, punching Twinson's heavily pregnant wife Zoe just to see what happens. <laughs> Thankfully, just a boing. Everybody in that game is made out of rubber, although somehow still able to conceive. <laughs> the thing is. <laughs> Thank you. And the, the weird thing.
think is that while something like the runaway example will make the developer look bad for forcing the player's hand, implementing something kind of weird or cruel or wacky around the side makes you look better because you've thought of it. You're kind of in tune with the player, you're doing what they want. It's even considered quite good design these days in interactive fiction to offer three basic op options in any situation. The good, the bad, and the maybe silly or rude, or the one which you know you're not meant to take, but you're drawn to anyway. I'm going to give one example. Uh, this is a scene from Knights of the Old Republic. Um, your goody-goody party, most likely, you can be even if you want, is masquerading with Sith baddies and basically trying to go undercover in the Sith Academy on the planet of Korriban. And it's a really awesome section. Basically, you spend most of the game having to be like the light side Jedi, like doing all the right options, and suddenly you have a point where you, have, where you get to play as the bad guy because it's the only way to maintain your cover. Anyway, this is a bloke you meet outside, over on the left, who is trying to work out what to do with three failed would-be apprentices. And your options, because of course you get to decide, I quote, leave them alone, kill them, or use the force to make them shit themselves. <laughs> now there's a power I want to see in episode end. <laughs> now the more serious the world, the more carefully this kind of thing has to be done. Uh, in a serious game, even the options to do something particularly awful can reflect poorly on the character and break the mood. Not always, though, as anybody who's played Mass Effect and headbutted the pesky reporter will definitely attest. By the, end of the, by the end of the series, it's a running joke. Uh, the third game has her ducking out of your first atta attack, going, aha, I'm not falling for that one again, and you beat the shit out of her. And for some, and for some reason, it's the most satisfying moment of the adventure. <laughs> thinking, of, thinking of Mass Effect, though, I do want to kind of finish off a lot of this by moving away from comedy games specifically, just to talk a, a little about the, the misunderstood role of humour in maybe more serious games. The fact is that if you're going to be making a comedy game, like, say, this morning's HMS Spiffing, I'm going to hope that you're fairly confident that you've got a sense of humour, that you know what you're doing as far as kind of joking goes, that you're, you're fairly comfortable being funny. However, humour has just as much place in serious games, and arguably even more importance. As I said, it's not just a narrative layer. Humour is a fundamental part of how we all get on with each other. It's how we make friends. It pushes back the darkness when we're scared. It, there is no greater sign of friendship than two people able to throw the most appalling lines at each other and then still go out drinking in the evening. Or maybe that's just my friends. <laughs> but either way, while a bucket of mud isn't always the way to sort of show your sense of humour, there's nothing like bursts of it to make us empathise with, like, and importantly, remember a character. I would say the Bioware of the master. Oh, sorry. I would say the Bioware of the masterless RPGs, with a good example being Modern Solus's scientific Solarian song, or the running gag that the only thing that Commander Shepard can't do is dance. This is a sequence which starts in the first one purely with some bad animation, but by the DLC of the third game has been upgraded to be a running joke. There's even a scene where she's dragged onto the dance floor by a love interest just to kind of really hammer it home. And it's one of the funniest moments in the game. Heartwarming, sensitive, and really appropriate to the character. And the often unspoken advantage of humour in this kind of game is that while something like Monkey Island 2 has to arguably oversell itself with something like, laugh so hard milk will come out of your nose, or your nose, because their grammar's not very good, um, a game that simply uses humour as one of its weapons can have those moments stand alone and feel special without maybe making the player always be going, oh, was that funny? You know, that's funny. Like, if you play Monkey Island 2 now, thinking this is going to be the funniest game ever, you're going to be disappointed. Because I don't think that any game can fully live up to that, whether it's Psychonauts or Portal or Stick of Truth or any of the other ones. But, for as much as I love Monkey Island 2 and games like it, most of my favourite funny moments actually come from games that weren't a constant stream of jokes. One of my favourite lines, for instance, is in Broken Sword 2, uh, where an American tourist is informed by a local guard, for a beautiful woman, I would walk to the ends of the earth. For you, I will go to the temple. <laughs> uh, or in, say, something like Dragon Age, you have the fantastic party dialogue, like uh, the pirate queen Isabella writing erotic friend fiction, or anything that comes out of the mouths of characters like the Iron Bull. 
not only are these characters witty and fun, these are the moments that make them more than just their stats and their party roles. They turn them from just being your regular guy with a sword and board into friends on both sides of the screen. That increased warmth, in turn, makes drama more meaningful, sacrifices more painful, and the whole experience more personal. Anyway, to finish, my point in focusing on Monkey Island isn't that if you copy it, you'll have a comedy classic. I think we all know that doesn't work. Many have tried and failed, and frankly, what we can do now has the potential to blow it away. Later games have done better characters, had sharper wits, had better pacing, had more focus, had better world, hell, even had endings. <laughs> As a comedy primer, though, you really can't do much better than to play it, with an eye towards the technical details how those jokes are timed, especially next to how few of them work as well with the voiceover that it was never written to have. How it happily plays its own stooge, defusing its drama with scenes like, and I think I'm one thing out, or, uh, um, yeah, there we go, I'm sorry, I cut it, I cut it the last minute. Um, play its own stooge, defusing its drama with scenes like this, the uh, opening to the Chuck's Doom Fortress, ultimately changing to this, <laughs> and then by the end of the game, to this. <laughs> the visual gags, like Guybrush's smirk at leaping out of the ocean in blatant defiance of the laws of physics. The punchy Twitter-style gags of the books of the library. Something which, of course, Ron, I didn't say Dave Gilbert, uh, has uh, used again for Thimblewing Park. The character design, I mean, especially the likes of, say, oh, Governor Fat, a man living the dream. <laughs> In short, you can find funnier games, but I defy you to find many that can make you funnier. And just between us, maybe that's even the secret. <laughs> um, I don't think I've destroyed my time, so how, about, how long have we got left? Um, Probably seven minutes. Wow. Yeah. Cool. Perfectly timed. Uh, any questions for anyone? You, sir. Yeah. Um, about uh, having characters uh, get away or playable characters get away with really bad behavior, I think one thing that works spectacularly is when the character in question doesn't even realize what he's doing. I'm thinking, of course, of Rufus from the Deponia games, who manages to feed three orphan children to a slime monster, which was even a vegetarian, trying to go vegetarian. I mean, Rufus never gets what he's doing in there, and it's a hilarious moment. I mean, is kind of a weird example, because it's, it's sort of contrary. I, th I think over here, the humor of it doesn't work as well as I think it does in Germany, um, because I think a lot more people do kind of pick up on the fact that Rufus never kind of gets punished for people. I think there's, 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 there's that, that puzzle where he gets um, where well, you sort of sell someone into slavery, I think, at one point. Yeah, and, 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 and I, I, think, I, think, I think they're not games I know all that well, uh, I, I must say, but I've, I've kind of played the first couple. Um, and I think, yeah, a lot of the time it does depend on like, where the player's sympathy is. I think sometimes, like, a character who is basically a walking disaster area can be quite fun. But I think that the problem comes if they're doing it in any way deliberately and mean-spiritedly, then they kind of have to get what's coming to them. Uh, otherwise, like I said, the player will usually have the sun and the sorcerer problem of kind of, you know, I, I don't like you. you know, I, I, need some, I need something to... Rufus gets a lot coming back to him. Exactly, yeah. he's most, of, most often he's the, the butt of his own schemes. So, mm. um, also unintentionally, of course, uh, which is maybe also these moments work. Mm. Yeah, he's definitely got an innocence to him, which, uh, um, say, Simon Sorcerer doesn't. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, will not, I will not argue with that one. Anyone else? Um, I think this is all really fascinating and uh, it bears further in, enlightenment, but uh, how does this relate to the dick? To the dick? <laughs> uh, well, they always say that sarcasm is the lowest, so the, the lowest form of wit. I would say that Boston would uh, argue with that. <laughs> <laughs> Puns! Uh, anyone else? <laughs> you, sir? Yeah, um, I've, I've, quite a lot of the jokes... I say jokes, but quite a lot of the comedic references he made, like the Chuck's uh, mm -hmm. and all that, they're all quite... Um, I wonder if a lot of the humour comes from like, like self-knowing, like a lot of self-awareness <coughs> in the game themselves. Mm -hmm. um, 
I, I don't know, I just think, I just wondered if there was anything to elaborate on that. But no, I, I think you're right. I think that you can get meta to the point that it becomes obnoxious. Oh, yeah. Um, I, I say that, that we, again, like something like, say, Kingdom of Magic, where, like, every line is, you're playing a game, isn't it wacky? Um, <laughs> do, does it doesn't really kind of work so well. I, I think what I, what I like about... What I, what I love about Monkey Island 2, I think probably my favourite thing about it, is that it's a slow progression um, from being a fairly serious game, obviously a serious game with jokes, but nevertheless, you know, it starts out fairly dark and like, um, you know, always with the sort of talk of you know, voodoo and curses and you know, like torture and so on. And then as you kind of progress through it, it kind of develops with you. And so kind of by the end, it's a comedy, um, but you kind of have to work to that point. And because you have that, that world set up so well, it's in a good position to kind of do like the, the blah, blah, blah kind of joke on the fortress. Because I think in part, it's mirroring what the player's probably thinking. Uh, whereas I think a lot of them which are sort of too quick to try and, you know, if we do the joke, then if we do the joke for the player, then we'll get away with like a bad thing. For me, it's the bad kind of sort of self-referential. Um, uh, the Bard's Tale is quite a good example. You kind of get a lot of sequences uh, where you'll walk into, a, into a, like a maze, and the guy goes, oh, not a bloody maze. And it's like, right, but you're still making me do a maze. You know, so that, that you, you don't have the moral high ground over the games that, that you're mocking. Um, well, I think the mon- monkey, actually, I think, handles it really well and it's kind of a good balance. Yeah, that's a bit. I felt that way about um, Uncharted 4, for example. Mm. There was a lot of... I was, really self-referential and sort of got it, but after a while, you know, there's that ludonarrative dissonance, whatever is um, the reward you get, but mm. lots of like, oh God, uh, you know, the bridge will fall down now and it'll take us another 15 hours to get It's kind of it's the point going. where it's probably like the point to, drop, to, to draw a line under the series, when, <laughs> when it looks like you, you kind of know the next set piece before it arrives. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, it, it can work. I think, I think the trouble with it is it's an easy joke, um, and I think there's nothing wrong with an easy joke if it works. But I think a lot of the time people will write the joke kind of like at 11 o'clock at night, so they'll be, ha-ha, that's funny. And they don't necessarily kind of go back to it. So it's like, well, is it really funny? Does it, does it contribute to something? Um, you know, is it more than just like, a, like the narrator sort of saying that? And I think it definitely in cases where the joke is sort of something like, this puzzle is stupid, then, then my response is, you should have redesigned your puzzle. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? Uh, and back the middle there. Um, as someone who's done writing work yourself, hmm. have you ever come across a joke that the developers or a previous writer on the same project has put in that you've just kind of gone, no, that's, <laughs> not, that's got to come out? Uh, not so much, but generally I'm kind of more the guy who's writing those jokes. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, this, this is a shout, a shout out to Olivia of Fail Better. I'm sorry for all the pain I've caused you with my puns. Um, I, I, w- I would say that in most cases, if you're going to if you're going to sort of do that, then it's going to be like a sort of general stylistic thing. Uh, I mean, a good example is that some of the scene we describe as well, um, I, I always say we. I'm a freelancer. I don't work for Fail Better. Um, but from the start, it's always been sort of described as uh, think you know don't don't write like Pratchett. Um, you know, try try and you know be more kind of like Victoria. Try and find the humour in something else. If you're just doing sort of snark here and there, um, you're you're not really writing in tone with the game. Um, and I think generally, the fewer writers you have, the the less that's usually a problem. Um, but yeah, you, you do have to kind of get consistency and try and avoid some of the cheaper gags. Anybody else? Last question now, please. Uh, let's go over there. Uh, do the writers ever think internationally their jokes? Because I remember in Monkey Island. The Monkey Ranch. Monkey Ranch. Spanish, and nobody got that. In my experience, no. <laughs> um, I, I would say that the worst example in the history of games is Toonstruck. Um, I'm sure that a lot of people here have played it. It's a great game. I, I actually really like Toonstruck. But the gimmick is that you're trying to repair a machine, and the machine works with um, combinations. So it's like sugar and spice, ball and chain. And the translators, I don't know how the hell they managed to do it, had to translate this into languages where those phrases didn't exist without being able to change any of the actual game. Um, and like I said, uh, ha- hats off to them. I don't know how anybody could. Uh, what I would say, the general localization tends to come in um, in some, some other areas. So, for example, with The Long Journey Home, one of the problems we're having at the moment is we have to translate into several languages and so we have to kind of keep the amount of text kind of you know, under wraps. 
Um, and sometimes it, it, I don't think it necessarily sort of stops people, but I think it's worth um, thinking through kind of like some of the details. Maybe it's like some of the, some of the gimmicks. Like, for example, we have uh, space pirates who talk in rhyme. And I've already apologised to the translator. I've said, you, you may do anything you want with these guys. This just, this just kind of works in English. But I, I think you can kind of make a lot of times um, easier for yourself just by avoiding, like, sort of too much pop culture stuff, like avoiding, like I said, what, what, what I've heard, for, again, for Long Journey is the aliens may talk to you about meat, but they won't talk to you about sandwiches. You know, so kind of, we kind of keep the, the themes and like, the items... Uh, general and so hopefully that gives that that kind of makes it a fairly sort of translation. But in the case of most adventure games with puzzles and things, nobody even thinks about it most of the time. Thank you and uh, we're all done. Thank you.